My name is George Heimpel, and I'm going to be talking about the same sy system that um, Anthony just did. So it's 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 great to follow that because I don't need to explain a lot of this. <coughs> but um, I'll be working more on um, the natural enemies, uh, the biocontrol si side of things, and uh, I'm in just just sort of starting the second year of this SAIR grant. Um, so I'll be giving a more sort of general presentation about the kind of work that, that the SARE grant kind of fits into, but the SARE from the first year will be there. <coughs> so just as Anthony said, this is just a brief intro to soybean aphid. Um, the soybean aphid is native to Asia, and it was first just discovered in uh, Wisconsin in um, the year 2000. And so this shows sort of the part of the country that it was in during just that first year. And it's now, as, as you know, spread through much of um, the soybean growing areas. And um, as Anthony mentioned, it's now sort of the primary, the key pest in soy, soybean. Um, an interesting thing is that if you, so this is showing um, the mil, millions of acres here in these black bars, or pounds sprayed um, um, within um, the north central states. So this is basically sprays for soybean aphid. Prior to the arrival of soybean aphid, very little spraying. Once it came, um, you can see that this really sky, sky, skyrocketed. Th these are um, NAS statistics. and. This is just for the years that, 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 that they're there. And so you know, we were up to almost 10, 10 million acres sprayed. Um, so it's, it's clearly um, an, an important pest. Um, oops, they're supposed to be. Yeah, there we go. Um, but it would be even a much worse pest were it not for natural enemies that are currently controlling it in the field now. So you know, you saw that you know we got up to at the peak in um, 2006, up to spraying about 10 million acres. Well, that's out of 70 million. So it's not like every field is getting sprayed. And part of the reason that not every field is getting sprayed is that there are native predators of the soybean aphid that are feeding on it. And so this just shows some of these. Um, Anthony showed a picture of a lady beetle, and there are lady beetles, and there are predatory flies and lacewings and predatory bugs. So there are a lot of predators out there, <coughs> excuse me, that are feeding on soybean aphid, making it less of a critical pest than it would otherwise be. Um, you can show this with simple cage studies, where you cage some plants, just as Anthony showed, and you leave some field sections uncaged. And if you do it for a short amount of time, even, you can see that um, the number of aphids uh, within the cages is much higher um, than in the open field. This is basically due to the action of natural enemies. This, th th this is a short enough time frame so that the cages aren't holding in the winged aphids, which can happen if you do this for a long time. So biological control is real. It's happening in our fields, but it's not happening um, to an extent to make the soybean aphid a non-pest. It's still a pest, um, and that's because this doesn't happen in every field. So um, much of the focus of my work has been um, to ask, how can we improve this? How can we improve biological control of soybean aphid so that it's a non-pest, so that we don't have to spray for it? And um, the host plant re resistance that Anthony talked about is a great way. Um, but biological, biological control is another way. And um, those two strategies do tend to work, to, work to, together well. Um, but I'm not talking about that. So I'll just focus on this stuff. So um, the, the main things um, that I've been working in my lab, or, or the main strat, strat, strategies, have been one to try to see what happens if we increase the d diversity of the cropping system. Um, and um, so I'll talk a little bit about that. And then the other thing is that, as I mentioned, the soybean aphid is native to Asia. 
And um, um, soybean aphid is a much different insect in Asia than it is here. And I've been to China a bunch of times. And you know, the main thing I come, come, um, come um, away with on those trips is that it's really hard to find soybean aphid. It's a rare insect there. Um, and when you find it, um, you find soybean aphids, and they're riddled with these little, uh, what we call mummies, which are parasitized aphids. And what's happened to these things is that they used to be regular uh, aphids going through their day, um, but a parasitic wasp um, came, came up to them, stung them, laid an egg inside them, and um, the larva then sort of um, fed, fed on it from, um, from the inside. And so um, a lot of my work has been go to China, find these parasitic wasps, see whether we can bring them here to release them. Um, the process of doing all that means that we have to be sure that they'll be safe. So there's, there, 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 there's an incredible long, incredibly long and rigorous process of safety testing that we have to go through. And um, we've uh, brought back um, about 20 species of wasps from Asia to put through this. And out of those 20, uh, we now have um, um, a permit for three. So three of those species turned out um, to be safe to release, and so we're now working on those. Um, and this is what one of those looks like. And so I'm going to talk about some of the work that we've been doing in these two areas. Some of that is a SAIR work, but once we get into the main part of our SAIR work, it's really going to be to look at an interaction. How does um, la landscape level d diversity interact with these wasps, and can that give us sort of the best biological control? So I'll talk first about some work that we did with d diversity. And this, this actually goes back to pre sare days. And this is work that we did in, um, in um, organic uh, beans. And um, it's, a, it's a fall seeded rye cover crop. And basically how this works is when you're on a corn to soybean ro rotation or wheat to soybean um, you harvest the corner of the wheat in the fall, and then you plant rye into that stubble. And then you basically let the rye overwinter, and then, you pl and then you drill beans into that rye, and then in the summer you mow the rye at, at just sort of the right time, and then you harvest the beans. And I'll just kind of show you. So this is what the rye looks like in its overwintering stage. So it's, it's, it, it's sort of a shaggy lawn. Um, obviously, this kind of cover crop has a lot of benefits beyond what we were looking at, which is looking at the effects on soybean aphid, um, because you're covering the soil. Um, and this is what it looks like in the spring, so it really gets up pretty high. And then um, you actually drill into those beans, I, I, I mean into that rye, so, so, so you dr um, drill the beans into that rye and it starts to come up. And um, that's, that's uh, when you mow the rye. And then you, know, you get this sort of mulchy looking field. This is one shot that we have. This is another shot that we have where we compared um, the rye covered beans with just you, you know, the monoculture beans. And so I'll show you data that we got. Um, this is a combination of on-farm studies and, and um, ex ex experiment station studies. And it worked really well. So in, in all of these studies, uh, we had much higher, well, in some cases much higher, but in all cases higher. Um, but here, much higher de densities of aphids in the mono crop, so uh, without rye. So with rye here, we had much lower numbers. This, this here, um, I have this line, it's supposed to be at 250. I don't know why it's there. It's supposed to be at 250, like Anth Anthony said, that's the spray thresh threshold. Um, so you can see that it worked here to control soybean aphid, which is great. You know, the danger, of course, is that the rye competes with the beans to such an extent that you get a yield drag. And we found at this site that this didn't happen, that the yields were you know, about the same. This is one site. Um, here's another site. This is a ex uh, field ex experiment station. 
not so quite pr pronounced, uh, but the yield was similar. Um, this is our favorite site. This is Lee, Lee Thomas's farm. I don't know if you guys know Lee, but um, he actually uses this rye sort of on a permanent basis, as far as I know. And um, the aphids in the monoculture beans got up to more, got up to about 6,000 per plant. And with the rye, it was much lower. So you know the aphids here got to, to such high levels that um, there's actually a yield drag um, for, for not having the rye. So you know, so you know, the rye actually gave a yield bump. You know, we were worried about a yield drag, but here we got a yield bump. So this is really in encouraging. Oh, sorry. Um, there's this. There, this is our last site <coughs> where there were fewer aphids with the rye, but this is a case where there was a yield drag. So I don't want you to think that this thing always works perfectly and that you always get a higher yield. This is a case where there's a yield drag, so there was a higher yield in the monoculture. This was a site in a year where it was very dry. And so what we think is that when it's dry, um, the um, effects of competition are stronger. So what, you know, so let's just think about these aphids which are lower in the presence of the rye cover crop. And my whole introduction about natural enemies and biocontrol and how great that all is. Um, what we thought might happen is that if we have the rye, that might give a better habitat for natural enemies, so you might get better biological control, pred predators eating aphids in the presence of the rye, but that wasn't the case. So, you know, at least for all the measurements that we did, um, we didn't find any evidence for better bi biocontrol. There are still fewer aphids, but not better biocontrol. So, what it probably is, is that if you have your beans growing in this kind of a setting, the aphids simply can't find it as well. And it also might be that the quality of the soy, the, uh, the, the beans are uh, lower for the aphids. So, you know, because there is some comp competition going on. But, you know, we, we think it's more sort of a plant-mediated plant effect than, than, than really biocontrol being better. Um, so I'd like to talk about the Asian parasitoid wasps now. And I'm just going to talk about two. And they're both in the genus Aphelinus, which is a really tiny little wasp. It's, um, you know, it's called a wasp, but it's nothing like a yellow jacket. So, you know, it's literally about the size of um, the period on a page, or it's smaller than that. Like, you know, if it was walking along a page, and if, you know, it could walk onto a period of size 12 font, and you wouldn't see it. It's that small. It's almost microscopic. Um, so there's two species. One is called Aphelina certus. This is not one of those that we got a permit for. This is one that came on its own. So just as soybean aphid was introduced, this one was introduced, and we don't know how. We don't really know from where, except that we know it's native to Asia. But it's now found here, um, and I'll talk about that one. The other one is Aphelinus glycinus, which is one that we got a permit for, so this is a safe one. This is one that really attacks only the soybean aphid, whereas this one attacks pretty much any aphid that, uh, that it comes into contact with. Oh, so yeah, this is um, the aphid parasitoid life cycle, which I already mentioned. So the wasp lays its egg inside the aphid. That um, uh, egg hatches into a larva, which feeds on the aphid from the inside. And then there's a pupa, and it pops out once it's ready, and then the whole cycle starts again. This whole cycle takes like 12 days or so, so it's pretty quick. And each, each wasp can lay you know, 200 eggs. So for Aphelina certus, um, the first thing I'd like to say is that um, we've been sam we, we first found it um, in Rose Rosemount, Minnesota, and St. Paul, Minnesota in 2011. 
And since then, this is data from this last year, so from the summer of 2014, and we're partnering with um, the Minnesota De Department of Ag to sample for it. And all these dots are sampling points, and the blue are the counties in which we found Aphelinus certus. So it's pretty much through, throughout the state, but for the whole time that we've been sampling it, we still have never found it in the southeastern corner of the state. So we'll see. So if there's anyone here from there, you know, I hope you don't feel too badly. Um, but so, so we'll follow that. Um, the second thing I like to show is just how it's been growing. So as I mentioned, uh, we found it just sort of ser serendipitously in August of 2011. And then, you know, in the next year we sampled for it. And you can see in 2012 there really wasn't a lot. This is uh, the number of wasps per plant. Sorry, this is kind of a small font. But it grew. So the highest number here is 40. So, you know, we're up to this last year um, a maximum average of about 30 per plant. You know, the maximum actual number of mummies per plant was more like a couple of hun hundred. So, you know, if you multiply that by the number of plants, um, you can see that this thing has now has now um, um, established well, and it's a pretty major player now. It's, uh, it's one of the one of the uh, most um, most unimportant natural en enemies of soybean aphid. So now I'd like to talk about Aphelinus glyc glycinus, and I'm uh, and, and it looks almost the same. And uh, we had, we got a permit for this in October of 2012. So, um, and we started to release it starting last summer and then this summer too, so 2013, where we did re releases in St. Paul. And 2014, uh, we did them again, we, we did them at, where did we do? Uh -huh. um, again in St. Paul and also in Cottonwood and um, North Northfield. And so this is one of our release sites. Basically what we do is that we rear them by the hundreds of thousands, which isn't that hard to do. They're very easy to rear in the lab. And we put them in these little tubs out in the middle of fields. And then we kind of monitor how far they spread. So there were these two sites that we used uh, this last summer, and at each one we released 75,000 wasps. And this is, by the way, the SARE grant. This, this is year one of what the SARE grant was about. And, um, and uh, so this was, you know, the week of J July 26 at both sites. And then you can see that at um, the Northfield site, you know, we got up to, you know, again, 30 to 40 mummies per plant in that area, like right around here, um, whereas Cottonwood less. So they were well able to establish during the field season at those sites. Um, what we don't yet know is whether they're able to overwinter. Uh, we're, we're pretty sure that the ones from the 2013 re releases, which were done basically to study ways to release it, and, and, and we use those data to develop this method here. Um, but we're pretty sure from all the sampling that we've done that they did not overwinter from that re release. And 2013 was a very harsh winter, so we're hopeful that maybe they'll be able to overwinter now, although this winter has been had some harsh times too. Um, so we're now doing an overwintering study and this is um, a buckthorn shrub. Um, and some of you might not be aware, but um, the soybean aphid overwinters on buck buckthorn. So um, it has this ob obligate movement from buckthorn in the winter to soybean in the summer and back and forth. And so um, this was a study, it's kind of hard to see because it's all white here, but these are buckthorn twigs that we've um, put mesh bags around and tied. And uh, we've, we, we had previously put wasps into those twigs that had aphids on them. So, you know, it's a way to see 
will these wasps be able to overwinter here under under field con conditions? And so that's this is just from from this season, so we'll know in the spring how they did. And um, that's sort of what I've got for you today. Just to conclude, um, one of my messages is that soybean aphid is a pest, but it could be a much worse pest if it weren't for the natural biological control that, that's happening. Um, but we want that control to be better. And so um, some of the things that we're trying to do is that we're trying to increase um, the landscape diversity. This is a picture of some plots that we have at Rose, Rosemount where we're using uh, prairie plots um, and seeing whether sort of a simulated prairie can um, aid biological control, which is part of the SEER grant that's sort of coming up. And we're also working on these uh, paras parasitic wasps. And our next step really is to try to combine these. Can we use this habitat management and the wasps in a way that are syner synergistic, just as Anthony was saying? Um, so I think over the next couple of years, we'll be able to figure that out. And, if, and I would just like to acknowledge various people that have worked with us on this, including farmers, um, Lee Thomas and Paul Guinea. And um, Sarah obviously helped to fund this, but uh, there are other funding sources as well. And if there are any questions, I hope we have some time for those. Yeah. Yeah. So the question was whether the height of the rye stems could have an impact, and I think it pro probably could. But it's, but it's not something that we really have measured or have looked at. So the question was, can we buy these wasps? You know, are they are they commercial commercially available? And um, the answer is no. And um, it just wouldn't be economically feasible to do that. So, you know, this is the kind of project that's done at, you know, uni uni universities and at um, the USDA. And if it works, they'll just spread throughout the region all by themselves or with a little bit of help. And in a few years, we'll all be saying, remember soybean aphid? Oh, yeah. You know. So the question, I think, was, right, right, was um, whether, whether or not we think that the wasps also overwinter on the buckthorn. Yes. So um, the answer to that is that we don't really know. But for this species, Aphelinus glycinus, which is a specialist, there really aren't any other aphids in Minnesota or in North America, except for the cotton aphid, which is really closely related to soybean aphid. So there really aren't any other aphids that it's likely to be able to overwinter on. Pretty much has to overwinter with soybean aphid. And soybean aphid obligately overwinters on buckthorn. So I think Aphelinus glycinus, if it's going to be an effective biological control agent, has to find a way to get to buckthorn. And it has to be able to overwinter there. Question was, um, how can soybean aphid be a pest in yeah. areas that don't have the overwintering host? Yeah. And um, the answer is that they're highly mobile little insects. They're blown, and uh, we know that they can um, be blown hundreds of miles. It's probably more like thousands of miles. So yeah, yeah. So um, the question is with these highly mobile pests, whether the natural enemies go with them. And actually, um, let me go back, because there's a picture I love here. Uh, OK. Um, so I'm showing these mummies, right? Here's two regular-looking aphids that turned into mummies. But this one, you know, you can see that it has wings. OK. So what does that mean? That means that, 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 that a wasp stung that aphid either when it had wings or when it was, you know, about to have wings. Because um, when, a, when a wasp stings an aphid, that aphid doesn't die immediately. It has the egg inside of it. Um, you know, the egg hatches after a couple of days, and meanwhile, that aphid is living, it's feeding, it's in some cases even reproducing, and it can fly. So, you know, what that means is that the wasps can basically hitchhike 
on their hosts. They can be carried uh, within the aphids as eggs. And that's what I think is sort of the primary mechanism by which they could follow um, you know, the aphids to the overwintering host and be closely linked in to the population di dynamics of the aphids. So the question was whether there's as much known about the distribution of Aphelina certus in other states. And the answer is not really. So um, Aphelina certus was actually first found in Pennsylvania. And then it was found, um, and, and, and it's very well known in, in um, the soybean growing regions of can, can, Canada. And there, you know, if you talk to people working in uh, Quebec, they say Aphelina certus is absolutely controlling soybean aphid. So, you know, it seems to me like, you know, it either came in on its own somehow, or there was a second um, intro, intro, introduction of soybean aphid with those things more on the East Coast. Because it, it sort of was on the East Coast and it got here in 2011, but it was known from the East. Um, but other states in between and to the West, it, it's just, uh, you know, we don't really know. I would say that, you know, soybean aphid's only been here for about 15 years. So, you know, it makes sense that the natural enemy community would, you know, adapt to it. And, you know, it also makes sense that it would grow because this is an amazing new food source. And um, the parasitic wasps that are native to here haven't really moved on to it very much. So to me, that's sort of a mystery. You know, I don't know why, because there are some wasps that can feed on it. And I don't know why they're not in the fields. But these predatory in insects, like the lady beetles and the predatory flies, they and the predatory bugs have sort of upped their game over the last 10 to 15 years. So Anthony was mentioning the threshold of 250 which uh, the, the research for that was done in 2004, 2005, maybe to 2006. Okay, that's fine. But, you know, this is just sort of my personal opinion. I think it's too, too low now. Um, and, I, and I see a lot of fields where the aphids go to 250, which is where a farmer is supposed to treat. And then they go to 400, and then they go back down. And Anthony rightly said that the economic injury level, actually for $6 beans, so is, is um, 675 aphids per plant. So, so that's why Anthony's looking at these softer in insecticides and his group with Bob, Bob Cook, that's one of the main things that they do. So definitely, uh, you know, the Lambda Cyhalothrin and the Esfen Valorate, highly toxic to all these natural en enemies. But there are people looking at these softer insecticides. I, I'm not so up on the literature. Um, I think a lot of times you do find what Anthony found was like, oh, this looks really promising. But you put it in the trials and it doesn't work all that well. But you know, you know that's it's not to say that there might not be some out there that are, that, that are effective.